He's back. How you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm glad to and honored to be back on the Wrestling Changed My Life podcast for the second time. So well, It's an honor to have you, and we're going to push this out on Spartan Combat as well, and we'll talk about that. But Gabe Dean, I got to say, one of the most memorable parts of our last conversation was the time you were talking about you and your brother and how it was your first year coaching and how you had maybe been too hard on him, and then that was kind of a turning point for you to become a selfless coach. But now – we're back in that selfish mindset. You're back on the mat. Tell me about this crazy transition, how we got to this point. Well, I, uh, about a month ago, I uh, got a DM from uh, Mike Mao from Flo. It's like, hey, if we put something together for an eight-man bracket, um, would you be interested? And I was thinking to myself, you know, I just did the thing with Dake and uh, went through the whole Chimizo thing. And I thought that was really neat and what wrestling is kind of evolving to uh, given the circumstances right now. So I was like, yeah, you know, I'd definitely at least be interested in it. And then I'd say about two weeks later, they were like, all right, we're doing this eight man bracket. And um, you know, like, are you, do you want to do it? And they had all the details in there, you know, obviously a 20 K for the winter and all the, the payout structure. And um, I was like, yeah, I'm in. Um, and then uh, about three, four or five days after that, uh, I was kind of thinking to myself and I was talking to Mike Gray and um, Coach Cole and they were like, hey, you, you know, you might as well wrestle in the U.S. Open. You know, you've been off the map for three and a half years uh, before you go down and wrestle in this eight man thing. So I was like, all right, you know, uh, I guess I'll put a good solid, you know, maybe seven to nine days under my belt <laughs> <laughs> and then go compete. So, and I wasn't totally out of shape or anything like that. You know, I obviously, um, you know, wrestle uh, quite often, every, you know, every week with the, the guys. So, um, but I definitely, I definitely, it was definitely different from being the, like the coach, you know, training regimen to obviously you're competing in out again regimen. Um, so I, uh, you know, I took advantage of that, you know, seven to nine days that I had and uh, ramped it up um, and you know, went, went and competed and, you know, got the job done. Not, not, I knew it wasn't going to be pretty. Um, just first of all, I, I, full disclosure, I knew it wasn't going to be my best. Uh, I wasn't going to be at my best probably. Um, but, you know, we just kind of found a way to win and um, definitely want to take it up and, you know, generate some more offense and, you know, obviously, be a lot more fun to watch and this eight man thing so. so before we get into what what your training looks like and all that will we see you at the olympic trials gabe dean i uh i don't know i'm taking a step at a time Ooh, I, I come know on. We, uh, i'm not gonna give a i'm not gonna give a no and i'm not gonna give a yes i'm taking a step at a time so okay uh, it's definitely it's definitely a possibility for sure. i hope so man i mean every every college coach you talk to says man if you know if i was competing now you know couple years out everything I know I'd be deadly and so you get that opportunity what did the training look like that ramp up period the eight to nine days well you know the first few days uh you know I uh I think coach Gray you know was trying to attempt murder on me um <laughs> you know <laughs> trying to get you know as much out of me as he can in those first couple of days and then you know try to you know obviously you taper into competition you don't want to be crushing yourself so but yeah, those first two, three days uh, between the lifting and the circuits and uh, live wrestling and the drilling and the sparring and, um, you know, it's something I hadn't felt in a, in like at that, that level in a long time. So uh, it was it was kind of a shock and uh, to no surprise after I got through the competition, my body was definitely in shock the next morning after uh, even after the first day um, I was <laughs> I was. Uh, I was in rough shape, uh, <laughs> just in terms of like, I, I, I felt, I felt old, you know, I felt, um, I hadn't been in the competitive, um, in the competitive, in the, comp I haven't competed and there's a different shape. There is the, there's non-wrestling shape, there's training wrestling shape, and then there's competitive wrestling shape. I would kind of describe those and the competitive wrestling shape, uh, the only way to get back into competition, you know, shape is to compete. So. Um, I was, and I also, I've gotten a little bit bigger than I was in college. Uh, so cutting weight again was 
you know, something I hadn't done in a while. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't a necessarily light cut to make, you know, 88 kilos. Uh, it was it was a hefty cut. Um, so just feeling all that again was, yeah, something I hadn't felt in a while. My body responded that way. So I was, I was going to say, I didn't know if the weight cut was just something where you were under or if this was a legit old school cut just like back in no, the No, it was old school, man. I mean, it was it was an old school cut. I was after day 1 and I was really hydrated, don't get me wrong. Um after day 1, I stepped on the scale after being done through the semis that day and I was 9 pounds over. So, <laughs> so it was uh it was a fun, a fun night for me, um, getting my weight back under control so I could make, make weight the next day and wrestle in the finals. So, um, yeah, just body was definitely in shock of what everything was happening. So, <laughs> Well, dude, you had a – I've heard you say on Twitter that you weren't happy with how you wrestled, but, dude, you had a loaded bracket. I mean, Headlay and then Jackson in the finals. I mean, that's a fun weight right now. I'm excited for it. Yeah, 86, you know. That that weight class has always been pretty tough. Um, always a lot of really talented guys. Uh, I knew I had my work cut out, cut out for me. There's a lot of young guys that are up and coming. Um, and there's obviously kind of the middle aged guys like myself. And then, you know, there's obviously really talented older guys. So, um, you know, wrestling uh, Luan and then Hidley and then Jackson. That was that was a heck of a that was a heck of a murder's row and uh, all really tough, talented guys. And, um, you know, when you get to this level, you know, you, you start wrestling in the second, you know, it's not like a regular college tournament, maybe the first or second round, you have maybe not the most talented guys. Um, every, it seems like every round, I mean, you watch Russian nationals this past weekend. It's just, like, it's just insane. You know, you're wrestling the best guys, some of the best guys in the world, some of the best guys in the country. Um, so you, uh, you gotta be ready to go. So. Well, it's something where, you know, I was going back and listening to our first conversation and you mentioned one point after the, the Buffalo open, the prestigious Buffalo open where you called the uh, called your dad and he goes, why do you wrestle? And you didn't have a good answer. So I got to ask you this time, is this a cash grab or why are you wrestling right now? What, what did it take to get you off the bench? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and a great referral too, to that point. I, um, you know, uh, it's definitely different than when I, you know, my mindset and my, you know, the reason why I'm wrestling now, um, you know, I didn't expect to ever wrestle again after college. I, you know, I was really embracing a full-time coaching career, especially since the last time we talked. Um, but you're way more, I guess when you're, you're kind of, I, I wouldn't call, I wouldn't say I'm a veteran by any means, but you know, you're more seasoned and you're just more relaxed you know it's it's almost like a good it's like a good challenge in front of you more than you're trying to it's not it's not me trying to win accolades or do anything obviously the money is incentive is, is an incentive um mm -hmm. it's more just like you know you really do uh get one life and you know as it's up to you as many challenges you want to take on um i've never been one to really back down from it and not to get too personal here but i uh you know, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, um, you know, I, I lost my uncle mm -hmm. to, to cancer. Um, he, uh, he grew up and his, his, uh, and his sons, his two sons are like brothers to me. They, they grew up right down the street, uh, pretty much in the same town as us. So they were, every time I go home or every time, you know, we were growing up, they, they were always there. You know, they were, it was like one big family. It wasn't like they were like distant cousins or a distant uncle. I mean, he was kind of like a, uh, my uncle Steve's kind of like a second, you know, father figure in my mm -hmm. life. Um, so, you know, when we were bedside with him and we were kind of watching him uh, go through that and kind of take his last breaths here on earth, um, I just thought to myself, you know, like, man, you really, it kind of just, it's the first time I've ever been through anything like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, just like, man, you really only do get one life to really, you know, do what you want with it. So, um, and we should never live life in fear. Uh, of the unknown um, it's better to know than to not know um, and through my experience so it was like well here's a couple opportunities to to live what you you preach and step up to the challenge so that's just kind of why it's like you know what let's do it and that was just and I, I remember I remember you mentioned your uncle was he your high school football coach as well no so that was my dad that's my dad's yeah. brother 
They also grew up down the street um, from me. Uh, <laughs> it's a big, it's a big family in Lowell, Michigan, man. I mean, you, you can't turn a corner without finding somebody that's probably related to to my family or you know my my my, my close cousins. Uh, it's actually my mom's uh, sister's husband. So, okay. so the, you know, my grandparents, my mom's parents, uh, they also grow up, grew up. You know, they also moved to Lowell when we moved over. Um, and then shortly after my mom's sister and, you know, my uncle Steve and, uh, Alex and Andy, um, my cousins moved to Lowell, um, to continue their education and, uh, play football and, uh, all that good stuff. So, um, uncle Steve was always, he was a big, uh, cook. He loved cooking. He was always really excited to see you every time you came home, just tons of positive energy and, uh, definitely inspired me to uh live life more fearlessly than than uh and take on challenges watching him go through that so um you know we, we it was real sad, really sad um and uh but we're working through it and uh it's definitely big, one of the bigger reasons why I took on competing again well we're sorry for your loss and i i can certainly uh empathize where you're coming from in that sense i mean anything like that will will really shake you to your core the thing that always makes me question is why is it only a death that makes something like that happen and, and not that that's the case for you but a lot of times you'll see people make changes after that but then also sometimes it only lasts for like you know a couple months afterwards because that's when the pain subsides so cool to see you taking action on it right away man yeah i think the you know i think the biggest thing is like it's a it's it's kind of like a punch in the face to change a perspective um you know and like i said it's like the first time i've ever experienced like that you know they brought them it was really sudden you know we were Gosh, you know, I was, I was, I remember I was drinking coffee at my kitchen table and I got the call and I, I knew he was battling, you know, he's been battling cancer for about 10, 11 months now. Mm. Um, but then they, they were like, Hey, you know, you got a uncle Steve's got, you know, days left kind of thing, you know, out of nowhere. I was just, wow. And, um, jumped in the car with my brother. We drove through the night. Um, they brought him home and hospice and got to have our last conversations with them. But, I think it's just, it really changes a perspective on, you know, for anybody, um, you can, it's so easy to kind of feel sorry for ourselves and let the world kind of beat us down, especially right now. Um, uh, and, and you just sit there and you look at what a guy's going through and as he's taking his last breath, you know, you're like, nothing can ever be as hard as, as this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so whatever that is and whatever I'm struggling with, I, I can figure it out because, you know, this is, this is the hardest thing that any human being has to go through uh, when you lose a loved one. Um, so uh, it just, it just puts everything into perspective that way. It does. And my girl, since we last talked, my girlfriend moved in with me and, and she's a physician assistant in the oncology unit at the university of Chicago. And every day they have eight to 10 conversations with people who are not going to live beyond two years from now, no matter what they do. And I just can't even imagine just the emotional burden that people like that, nurses, doctors, physician assistants in those cancer units go through on a daily basis. It's just like yeah. crazy. Oh my God. Oh my. First of all, congrats, Ryan. Yeah, did Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, my, actually my girlfriend is a nurse. Uh, she's finishing nursing school right now, working in a hospital for her last month and a half. And um, she says the same thing. It's just like, God bless those people that, you know, you're, like you said, you know, you, you're, you're, she's dealing with in, in oncology where they, they literally are like, yeah, you're not going to live for two, year, two, two or more years. So it's, uh, it just kind of, it, it really does. It just puts every, like I said, it puts everything in perspective. You're like, you know, why am I feeling sorry for myself? Because you know, my, I don't have milk to put in my coffee, you know, or <laughs> why, why, why do I feel bad about like having a, you know, a tough day at work or, you know, like I got my butt kicked at practice or, you know, like, why am I feeling bad? You know, my life is, is, is fantastic, you know, compared to some, what are these other people are going through? And um, I think that's important right now for all of us to keep into perspective. I mean, a lot of us have a lot to be thankful for, even in through a pandemic and what our country is experiencing. Um, there's still a lot to be thankful for. So I think those kind of events that happen in people's lives end up putting a lot of things back into perspective. For sure. And on a more, you know, on a lighter note to your saying about new perspective, wrestling world has a new perspective of all these pay-per-views happening. How do you, how do you take this and where do you see it going from here? 
I think it's great. I, um, I think it's something that our sport has needed. Um, you know, you almost see like it's a little bit transition to the beginning stages of the UFC and, um, you know, kind of how they built, you know, that brand. Um, now, I, uh, I, I think, you know, wrestling needs stuff like this. Um, and it's awesome because the viewership's been phenomenal too. Um, you know, I've watched all the events up to this point that could have possibly happened, and, you know, the high school events and kids I'm recruiting and stuff like that too. And it's just, it's fun. You know, you're sitting on your, you're sitting on your couch. I, I make some popcorn and I'm sitting there watching wrestling, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty cool uh, outside of just like the big 10 network and things like that. So uh, I think it's wonderful for our sport, great exposure. And I think it's something that I don't think we should just lose after, you know, we open back up again and we're back to being fans and seats. I think we should keep this model uh, going. I love how it's not the, I love how it's the individual pay-per-view model versus a dual team. Cause we've seen that yes. in the past and I never understood why, why we tried to do that because I don't think there's any need to do that. Well, you know, you realize that you only need really a wrestling mat, a clock, and a ref, and then people, the two guys to weigh in, and then you got you got something to sell, and you got something there for people to see. Um, so instead of, like, you know, renting out huge stadiums and, um, you know, paying for lights and, you know, all the different theatrical things, and um, it, let's just, you know, we can put it in a barn and put a mat down and, you know, pay-per-view it up and put two great wrestlers across from each other. And people are going to love that. Uh, it doesn't need, you know, it, let's be smart about the way we, you know, incur costs while we're trying to build um, our sport. And I think it's kind of done that, um, you know, as you've seen with like, like, again, I'll refer back to Bacon Chimizo. I mean, that, that venue is in a, a hotel room ballroom, you know, I mean, and they, they, they black out the, uh, the area, they put all the stuff that they need in place and, there you go. You're good to go. So I, I, uh, I think it's a great model um, to, you know, kind of get us jump started on that, that new wave. And speaking of farms, how do we get Joe Decina to throw one out at the ranch in Vermont, man? He would do it in literally two seconds. If I could, I could text him right now and he'd be like, when, when and where, like, when do you need this to happen? Let's do it. Let's go. He's a, he's a do. He's more like, and I think the way that he's built his company and his brand um, is like, Hey, let's just, do it and then we'll learn from there <laughs> <laughs> like even if we make fifteen thousand mistakes we're gonna know next time and then we'll go again you know kind of thing that's kind of how he is um which i respect i actually i prefer that way of learning and i kind of prefer that that model uh, i'm more of a hands-on guy myself so i'm trying to be as prepared for anything as you can without making any mistakes the first time you do it it's just it's impossible so i kind of just like yeah let's just go and see what happens but he would do it in two seconds if we asked him to right now i might have to send the link to this podcast right now because we were talking this morning and he actually called me right as we were getting going here about some another thing we're working on but for people who don't know how important this is for wrestling i just wanted to take five minutes and for you to kind of fill them in so joe decina is the ceo of spartan races which is the largest obstacle course race company in the world he's connected with the top of the top i mean He's been on Tim Ferriss. He's been on Joe Rogan. What is his involvement with the Cornell program and the RTC out there? So Joe actually, um, you know, you, you ever hear him tell a story? He was actually a Cornell grad. He, uh, he was turned down. He's like the Rudy of Cornell. So he was turned <laughs> like multiple times, multiple times. He tried, he kept applying, turned down, kept applying, turned down. Finally got accepted. Um, and uh, you know, in a, in an area that I don't ever think he ever even used a degree, but he, um, he, he went and he worked on, he, I know he worked on wall street for a little bit afterwards. And, um, but he always, he really was just, just attracted to this, you know, this really healthy lifestyle and, and, and affecting people in a positive way. So started, started these obstacle course races. Well, if you've met Joe, he's, uh, he loves really intense stuff, actually probably too intense for most of us. So he, um, he, start, he first started obstacle ra course races, and I'm not sure what the actual company was called when he started it, but it was, uh, they were too extreme. So he had like 10 people show up to the race because it was, a, it was just like nuts, like what they were going to have to do. And then, uh, you know, kind of refigured the model and then came up with this, you know, these different obstacle courses and 
it took off. They're in 45 different countries now. They have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of races. And um, they're in stadiums like the Dallas Cowboys. They hold the event in there. And they, they, they I mean, they, they, they're huge. Um, well, I remember my freshman year, actually, I came into the wrestling room. And there was this guy in the corner of the wrestling room just doing burpees. Like, just like he was just in the corner of our wrestling room doing burpees. And I was just kind of like, and I didn't know Joe DeSena at all, you know, like, so I was just like, who is that guy? You know, <laughs> it's just, and, and, I mean, just rep it out burpees in the corner of our wrestling room. So I was just like, oh, you know, whatever, you know, people come through here quite often, you know, and uh, a lot of times their alums are, you know, they're, you know, I mean, there's been alums, you know, we might have a couple of alums that have come in and try to request to wrestle in practice. And I, you know, they're, I don't think that's like the smart, thing to do, you know? <laughs> so anyway, it's just kind of a new thing. I was like, Oh, there's a guy doing burpees in the corner of our wrestling room, whatever. Um, so we went through practice and I swear, I kid you not, he did burpees through the whole practice. I mean, he did not stop. He was in the corner still doing burpees by the time we wrapped up, which was probably about an hour and a half later. And I just was like, all right, I got to know who this guy is. So I was like, I went over to Coach Cole and I was like, hey, you know, who's the guy doing burpees over there? And he's like, oh, it's Joe DeSena. And I'm like, you know, who is Joe DeSena? And he's like, well, he's the CEO of Spartan Races. And I was like, no kidding. You know, and I knew Spartan as a brand. It's a, it's a huge brand. So, I, you know, I've, I've seen it every, everywhere I go now. I'm in the airport. I see people wearing Spartan Race shirts. I'm like, oh, you know. Um, but anyways, I, you know, and then, he, and then he got done with his burpees and he interviewed – he had his interviewing team there. So he had, uh, you know, his production team, a couple people from his production team there. And they interviewed me and Nashawn. And, um, and then I got to know him through that. And then, you know, the relationship was always there. He'd always been a supporter of our program. Uh, but then, you know, kind of Coach Cole had the idea of rebranding our Olympic movement under the Spartan brand, which I thought was, I thought was brilliant. And um, we worked on negotiating a deal that would benefit both parties in doing that. Um, at the same time, our building was is finishing renovation, adding 6,000 square feet. And uh, it's definitely the nicest training facility in the world now for wrestling. I mean, it's got um, Dunkin' Donuts Cafe. It's got a movie theater in it. It's got, you know, pool table and uh, in-ground in, in, in hot and cold tubs, uh, 15,000, 1,500 square foot weight room, uh, a new uh, wrestling room, a new sauna, a new locker room. Um, and uh, new Hall of Fame walkway. Well, when we were going through this branding with Spartan, you know, since there there are there we're the Spartan Combat, you know, RTC now. We're gonna re we we are rebranding the walls of the weight room and the um, RTC wrestling room uh, to their brand. So that's kind of cool. You come in and it's Cornell, and then you come into the back and uh, the, the the six thousand extra square feet we added on. You know, you know half of that is now Spartan Brandon now because we're the Spartan Combat, you know, training, regional training center. So uh, it just kind of all came together at once. And Joe, thankfully, was willing to step up and do it. And he loved it. And, you know, now we, now we're, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's really neat. It's so. amazing to have, to your point, that brand is a global brand. And what, uh, one of the other things Joe has been big on is this Spartan Combat branch of his company, and that's, you know, they're going to be selling gear and, you know, he really wants to grow that brand base within the wrestling community. And it makes sense because everyone who's doing those Spartan races are just a bunch of animals anyway. And a lot of times oh, yeah. they have that wrestler mentality. Yeah. And that's, that's what he loves too. That's what he loves about, uh, that's why he's so drawn to wrestling because he, you know, it's a little psychotic in a way. Um, and that's what he loves. So he, uh, it, it just made a lot of sense after sitting down with him and kind of going through everything um it's just it was perfect you know it's just like yeah we should operate under this brand it's you know not only it represents you know the combat so well you know you look at all the combat sports you know the ufc jiu-jitsu and all those a lot of the best guys in those sports are wrestlers i mean wrestling's kind of the foundation for that um so it just made sense to partner and, and do something neat and kind of you know create something um new and exciting for the you know, the, the wrestling movement in a way, you know, maybe kind of jumpstart some other potential ideas. And we're working through some other things right now that I, I think are going to come out here and not too shortly in the near, you know, in the, in the future. So uh, I'm excited for where this partnership is heading. It's bringing a lot of new opportunities. And you're not kidding about Joe. He will literally do 
crazy workouts. Like, be, wrestlers think they're crazy. I think he's sicker than anyone I've ever met when it comes no, to – No, he takes the cake, man. I, I, I've seen some pretty crazy dudes and tough dudes, and uh, he wins. Like, I, I, I haven't seen anybody uh, quite like Joe DeSena. He's one of a kind. So, uh, yeah, you just go spend a week with him at his farm, and you can live it yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Do that at your own caution, ladies and gentlemen. Let me tell you. Yes, yes, yes. Be, uh, be, be, care- be careful, though, because you'll be, uh, you'll be waking up early in the morning and you'll be doing some fun stuff. So, um, yeah. Two, two other things I wanted to hit you with, Gay Dean, then we'll, then we'll let you out of here, my friend. Question one, the Derrick Henry, Kyle Dake, Oklahoma Drill <laughs> Challenge. Oh, man. Let's you- talk about it. So I was watching, uh, was it Tuesday last week, the Titans play um, the Bills. And I was at one of our, you know, favorite um, Mexican restaurants in here in Ithaca with Coach Cole and Scotty Boykin. And we were sitting there watching it. And Derrick Henry gave the meanest stiff arm I've ever seen to this guy trying to tackle him. He literally threw the guy off his feet. And, you know, me and Kyle have been in a lot of discussions before where it gets, you know, it's, it's always it, tears on the line of friendly and then actually getting, like, kind of heated where um, he was at the ESPYs when he graduated and he met Adrian Peterson. Um, and we argued that – he argued that he could tackle Adrian Peterson and I said no way um, in an Oklahoma drill. And uh, so then I saw that – and, you know, this is, this is years in the making. I mean, me and Kyle have had that argument probably 15 times in the last three years. <laughs> and, and, like, guys have come in from, like, you know, guys on the team have picked up on it too. So, like, guys know, like, that it's like this, like, this, like, little, you know, inside thing that our team has. You know, can Kyle Dake tackle Adrian Peterson? But then I saw Derrick Henry do that, and I was like, okay, like, there's no way he could tackle Derrick Henry. No way. <laughs> Coach Cole is like, one out of ten times, 100%, he could tackle Derrick Henry. I'm like, dude, there's no way. He's, he's 6'4", 248 pounds. I mean, there's just no chance. I mean, I, I respect Kyle for everything that he's accomplished. He's obviously an amazing wrestler, one of the best. Um, but the, the, we're talking about Derrick Henry here right now. So, um, you know, Kyle's 175 pounds, dripping wet. And you got, you know, Derrick Henry running down at you. So, uh, and Scotty was kind of more on my side too. So I was like, you know what, you know what, we're just going to settle. It. We're going to put it on Twitter. They usually will answer the question and just <laughs> let it go. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of, it was funny. I, I didn't expect the amount of response that it got, but it, it definitely got some responses. So it was, it was kind of funny. It made us laugh. It was, I saw that about two weeks after I saw someone post, LeBron looking super jacked and someone goes could um it was one of the UFC fighters who was talking a lot of crap like a middleweight it's like could he take down LeBron I go yes in an instant but now what you're talking about though is a little bit different because Henry's coming at you full steam I want to set it up I'm like how can we make this happen just so that we can settle this argument I mean this is years in the making at this point so I'm like whether it's Adrian Peterson or Derek Henry let's get it done I don't know how we can get in touch with their agents but can we pay-per-view that because I'm sure people people would watch that right I mean I'm thinking we call Joe DeSena on a three-way call. We set up the pay-per-view event, and, like, the main last intermission before the main wrestling event is Kyle Dake versus Derrick Henry (laughs) in Vermont. Oh, people – so many people would watch that. Oh, my God. That would bring other other fans of different sports into play because of Derrick Henry, all right? So can we start setting up, like, you know, those kind of matches? Um, Not, like, where – you know, maybe they wrestle and then they also, you know, do, you know, an Oklahoma drill to cater to Derrick Henry's profession, you know. So maybe we can <laughs> those kind of things up. Joe, honestly, if I said that to Joe, he would try to figure out how to do it. He would. Yeah. He would 100 percent. So, yeah. Dude, how scary is it to watch the NFL and just think if Khalil Mack or Derrick Henry wrestled heavyweight, like what the hell would they do oh, to freestyle? Oh, my <laughs> gosh. I – well, I kind of, we kind of got a little bit of a taste of that with Stephen Neal, right? With yes, uh, you know, like he ended up being a three-time Super Bowl champ, starting. I think he was right guard. I know he's a guard. I just don't know if he's the right or left. But starting right guard on um, with Tom Brady and the Patriots. So I look at these guys and I'm like, man, if Khalil Mack or you know, even like 
you know, LeBron's not tough enough. But if even if LeBron James was, you know, tougher and decided to wrestle, you know, you got 6'8", 265 pounds. You got Khalil Mack, he's 6'4", 6'5", you know, 265, 255 right in there. Just like, what would they do in our sport at heavyweight? Mm. I, I don't know. They'd be terrifying. I will say that. Um, it, it's scary. Yeah, for sure. It would, it would be, it would be kind of cool to see. My dad was coaching at um, Michigan state and uh, when I was a kid and Michigan state uh, had defensive end that was actually drafted number one overall in that year's his, his class's draft. And it was when Nick Saban was coaching there. Um, he was the head coach of Michigan state at the time. Mm -hmm. And he also had a background in wrestling. He wrestled in Illinois. You're going to have to look up this guy's name. I can't remember his name. Um, but he wrestled in Illinois for two years, so he had a wrestling background. And he came into the wrestling room one day. You know, this is the number one overall draft pick in his class. You know, he's, he was uh, – my dad described him. He's about 6'6". He's right, walking right around like 300 pounds. And uh, came into the wrestling room and wanted to wrestle one day. And Michigan State at the time had a guy that had been in the round of 12 twice. Um, his name was uh, Matt Lamb. And uh, – he, they they had him wrestle, and apparently this dude just absolutely just just ha had Lamb just like crying. <laughs> he but, won. Oh, this guy just yeah, this defensive end just absolutely destroyed. <laughs> if, if Matt if Matt's listening to this right now, I mean, I hope he's laughing because it's like it, it's funny to look back at. I mean, oh yeah, number one draft pick in the NFL you know, that had a wrestling background um, in high school as a two-time state champ, I think, in Illinois. And this dude apparently came in and just, like, had him in tears. Like, it was just, like, tossing him around. Like he was Oh, my God. And I was just like, man, I wish – apparently I was there, but I, I, was too, I was too small to understand anything that was happening. Um, but I wish I could go back and just, like, watch that again. Cause like my dad, my dad just sat there and just was like, I was just in awe. I couldn't believe it. we, they were trying to get him Nick Saban to let the guy jump on the, like their team. Cause they were wrestling Minnesota that, that weekend. And Brock Lesnar was, <laughs> was, the, was the heavyweight. So they were trying to convince Nick Saban, like, like, please let us just have him wrestle in this match. Like, please. You know, and it was the the rules were a lot looser back then, I'm sure. So they could do stuff like that. So they were like, "Please, Saban and uh, Saban, Saban wouldn't let him." So, um, but I understand that piece as well. The dude ended up being a more trash choice in the NFL, so can't get him hurt or anything. Dude, there's a, a that reminded me of a a guy who wrestled at Boston College when they still had wrestling. He'd only wrestle like one weekend of the year, and it was the conference tournament and then the nationals. And he was an All American, and he was a pro football player. I can't remember oh. his name, but was it you who told me that? I don't think it was me, but it's just like, you know, you get a little bit of a taste to see what it would be like if those guys could wrestle. It would be, it would oh. be insane. Ridiculous. Yeah. Well, the, the last thing I wanted to ask you about is the Dean's List talk show. Is that, does that still have some life in it or is that seen its day? Yeah, no, actually, um, you know, I've been kind of quiet for a little while on it, but we've actually just been recording. So I, I've, been, um, I've just been building up content because I know when things get crazy, it's, you know, it's just, uh, it's just, uh, it's hard to do that kind of stuff. So, and also we're going to, we decided we're going to release like a, a season of it. So it's, we're going to, we're going to like release like 10 episodes here in the near future um, for anybody that, you know, wants to listen. Um, you know, I just, uh, I appreciate you bringing it up. Um, I love it, dude. I think it's awesome. No, it's, uh, it, it, it's really just a hobby, you know, and I have a, you know, a good, one of my best friends is, you know, good at at least, you know, knowing the basics of producing it. Um, you know, we're not quite on your level, uh, Ryan, but you know, we, uh, we just, you know, we, we like to push out content just, you know, just for fun. And, um, I, uh, yeah, we'll be coming out. Uh, we'll, we'll be dropping about 10 episodes here probably inside the next couple of weeks. I can't wait, man. Um, well, this is my number one focus. That's your, maybe your 75th focus. So it's a, uh, well, I love listening. You know, I listen to all, I listen to all the rest and change my life, uh, change my life podcast. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan and a uh, huge fan of what you're doing. So I, I appreciate it, man. Well, I will, I'll, uh, I'll share some of those episodes as soon as they come out. It's the Dean's list talk show available anywhere. Podcasts are Gabe Dean. We can't wait to see you back out there at the flow event. 
please wrestle at the Olympic trials. We want to see you all the way through. Might as well at this point, man. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, like I said, I'm not making any promises. I got a, I got a pretty good feeling that that might happen. So. All right. Good, man. Well, thank so, you very much for your time. Always great to catch up. Hey, my pleasure, Ryan. Thank you.